Hi, I'm Doug Methley, co-director of Honor Flight Chicago. And on behalf of our entire organization and our thousands of volunteers, we would like to say to our Vietnam veterans here on Vietnam Veterans Day, thank you for your service, thank you for your sacrifice, and most importantly, welcome home. We're excited to have gathered 11 of our Vietnam veterans today on Vietnam Veterans Day for a Q&A session with area high school students who are part of our Operation CLIMB branch of Operation Education, which seeks to connect our veterans with local schools so that they can learn the value of sacrifice, service, and also gratitude for the veterans in our life. Right now, I'd like to introduce to you our 11 veterans who will be joining us on today's call. They'll tell you a little bit about themselves and their service before we get into the Q&A. So we'll begin with Terry Blue. Uh, my name is James Blue, a United States Marine Corps. I joined the Marines in 1967. I received my last discharge in 1998. I was over in Vietnam from 68 until 69. I got medevac from Vietnam. I got out to the Marine Corps, I got gung-ho, went back in the Marine Corps in 71, stayed from 71 to 76. I went back in the Marines again, stayed from 76 until my last discharge in 98. Here I am now, and what I do now is try and help veterans any way I can to get claims adjudicated through the VA system. Next, we'll go to Bob Bruzic. Hello, my name is Bob Bruzek. I was with the United States Navy Seabees in a construction battalion from May of 1966 to May of 1968. I served one year in Vietnam from May of 67 to, uh, to 1968 in Phu Bai uh, as an electrician, and I ran four 750 kW power generators while I was there. Thank you, Bob. Next, Russ Caforio. Hi, my name is Russ Caforio. I uh, uh, was an inf infantry platoon sergeant in the U.S. Army in 1968 uh, in La Cay, Vietnam, with the 1st Infantry Division, uh, doing search and destroy by day and ambushes by night. I did get injured and uh, ended up going to Japan for an operation, but thankful to be alive and home. Thank you, Russ. Next, Rick Campbell. I enlisted in the Navy in 1966. In 1968, I got attached to the 3rd Marine Division and got sent to the Vietnam in 1969. And uh, I was medevaced out in August of 1969, uh, went to the USS Repos, came back to 3rd Medbat, and the 3rd Marines got pulled out in October, I think it was, to, and went back to Okinawa, and then I went back to Camp Pendleton. Then I did 13 years in the Illinois Army National Guard. Thank you, Rick. Next, we'll go to Luke Cavelli. Hi, my name's Lou Cavelli. I joined the Marine Corps when I was uh, 17 in 1963, and I was discharged in 1966. I spent 1965 and 66 in Vietnam. I was 1st Tank Battalion, 1st Marine Division. Uh, we were used as infantry as well as uh, tankers. A lot of times our, our tanks were immobile because of the monsoon seasons. So we were used on recon patrols, uh, seek and destroy missions. Thank you, Lou. Next we'll go to Donna Gleamy. Hi, my name's Donna Gleamy. I served in the United States Navy. I was in from 1973 to 1980. I um, served for the Vietnamese War, I served to help support a patrol squadron in the Philippines. I was a data systems technician. Thank you, Donna. Next, we'll go to Joe Lammy. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Joe Lammy. I served with the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment, U.S. Army, from uh, November of 1966 until January 1967. Uh, I was injured twice while I was there. Uh, in January of 67, I was air evac to uh, Yokohama, Japan, where I had about a half a dozen uh, surgeries on my right foot. Uh, I served in the Republic of Vietnam and my job was 
combat medic with combat medic medical badge. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Mm -hmm. Our next veteran is Charles Nichols. Good afternoon. My name is Charles Nichols, United States Marine Corps. I joined the Marine Corps in 1966. And in 1966, after completing uh, combat training, I was deployed to Vietnam. I uh, served uh, one tour, not quite a full tour in Vietnam, approximately uh, seven months and was uh, wounded and medevaced to uh, Japan. And upon uh, doing that, I was uh, released from the Marine Corps and uh, returned in uh, 1967, where I did a second tour in Vietnam. Thank you, Charles. Next, we'll go to Louis Rodriguez. My name is Louis Rodriguez. I, uh, I enlisted in the Army in June of 1966 after going through different trainings in Airborne School and BASIC and AIT. I went to the 82nd Airborne in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. From Fort Bragg, North Carolina, I was uh, uh, shipped to... Uh, the Republic of Vietnam with 101st Airborne. I I got there in 1967 for one year. I was wounded uh, in the Battle of the Asha Valley. I was uh, medevaced to the USS Sanctuary, a hospital ship. And then from there, I was taken to uh, medevac to Japan. In Japan, I stayed a, a couple of months and from there, I was matter of fact, back to the States. I ETS in uh, June of 69, and I was out for a couple of years. And then I went back to the active reserves. In the active reserves, I stayed there about 16, 16 or 18 years. And uh, I was... Uh, I received the Purple Heart in Vietnam, and I also re received the, the CIB, Combat Infantry Bash. And uh, here I am trying to cope with all this stuff that's going on. Thank you. Thank you, Lewis. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Pat Tyner. Hi, I enlisted in the Air Force in October of 1968 and was discharged May of 1976. Stateside, I served in Texas, Mississippi for training, and then Missouri and Arizona. And in May of 1974, I went to the Philippines to join my husband. So I didn't actively serve in Vietnam, but I served in a support role as an air traffic controller at Clark Air Base from May of 1974 until May of 1976 when we came home and were discharged. Thank you, Pat. Next up is Tom Zilla. Hi, I was drafted and ended up with US Army Aviation. I was in country in 64 and 65 as an advisor. I was based out of Da Nang, which is in the northern part of South Vietnam. My job was flight operations specialist, which included flight planning, tower operations, flight following, crash and rescue. And I was a door gunner on Huey helicopters for my unit. Thank you, Tom. And thanks to all of our veterans for being here uh, for this Veterans Day, Vietnam Veterans Day event. Our questions today are gonna to come from a panel of high school students who are part of our Operation Climb. It's a branch of our Operation Education Initiative to connect veterans with students in local communities. At this time, Madeline, who's a sophomore at Batavia High School, is going to give a brief overview of the exciting work this group is doing to honor our heroes. Doug, Operation CLIMB is a volunteer group made up of high school students from the Chicagoland area. CLIMB stands for Connect, Learn, Inspire, Motivate, and Build. We meet every other Sunday to discuss new ways to get high schoolers involved in Honor Flight, 
This is a brand new initiative and we are growing very quickly. Operation CLIMB is always working on exciting projects that help Honor Flight in many different ways, including volunteering, fundraising, working with the veterans, and lots more to come in the future. If you are interested in learning more about Operation CLIMB, you could contact Nancy Steger or Gretchen Rohr. Fantastic. Thank you, Madeline. And now let's get into our questions. And our first one's going to come from Annabella from Downers Grove South. Hi, this question is for Rick Campbell and Luis Rodriguez. Were you drafted to serve or did you enlist? If you were drafted, what was your initial reaction? If you enlisted, what inspired you to do so? I uh, enlisted in the Navy in 1966, in October of 1966. Uh, I did four years of Army ROTC in high school, and I knew what was going on in Vietnam, so I wanted to stay out of Vietnam. <laughs> so I enlisted in the Navy. And I uh, went through boot camp in Great Lakes, and got trained uh, well, after I graduated from boot camp. I went to the uh, USS Yosemite AD-19 out of Newport, Rhode Island. And I had a surgery on my spine on board the ship. And I realized that the, the hospital corpsmen were such nice people. They took such good care of everybody and everything that I decided I wanted to become a Navy hospital corpsman. And I asked to be transferred back to Great Lakes for the school. I went back there and graduated from the hospital corps school. Then I uh, got transferred to uh, the third Marine division right after I got married in March of 1969. I had to go to Fleet Marine Force in Camp Pendleton and I went to Vietnam in April. And uh, it was, uh, quite an experience there. I'm very proud because I heard this on Honor Flight and this is what made me cry a lot. My job there was to keep as many names off the wall as possible. And to this day, I still, I still try to do it as much as I can. And when I got out, of, when I got wounded August 7th, 1969, I was hit with a shrapnel from a grenade that I, when I was working on a Marine, and I stayed out there two days before I got medevac because there were no other hospital corpsmen in our platoon to take care of the Marines that were still there. So uh, two days later, I got, they sent somebody out to replace me and I went out to the USS repos. They took the shrapnel out of me, sent me back to third med bat. And then they pulled every, the whole third Marine division out of Vietnam in October or November. I was the opposite of uh, of him, uh, what motivated me to enlist in the army was the the program combat. I don't know if some of you old folks like me remember combat with Vic Morrow. That used to be my favorite show, and I used to love the whole idea of going and for an operation or something and, and, and staying safe and staying alive because that depended on how well you were trained. So uh, I did that and and I enlisted in, Janu uh, in June of 66 because I wanted to go to Vietnam because I wanted to jump out of airplanes. A lot of people thought I was crazy or stupid or whatever, but that was me. I was gun ho always was gun ho and uh, that's what motivated me to go. And I don't regret it. I've never regretted it. The only thing is that my ideology changed a little from being uh, so patriotic and gun ho to why, after I got out and found out why, how the Vietnam War started, you know, because of a lie and everything, then my my uh, idea started to change. Thank you for that, both of you. Our next question will come from Haley from Illinois Math and Science Academy. So for Tom and Rick, do you remember arriving in Vietnam and what it was like? Oh, yes, I do. Uh, I arrived in Vietnam as part of a unit, the 7th Airlift Platoon. We came directly from Fort Riley, Kansas. There were 
Our unit consisted of 28 officers, 38 enlisted men, and we came with all of our equipment, helicopters, vehicles, armaments, and foot lockers of equipment, paperwork, and personnel files. For whatever reason, my CO sent me and those files up to our battalion headquarters at Camp Holloway near the town of Pleiku in the Central Highlands. I spent a couple of days in a hooch. It was like a summer camp tent house. Then I was told finally that a C-130 large cargo aircraft would fer fer ferry me back to Da Nang in my unit. I got to the flight line and was told that the aircraft would not stop for me because of mortar attacks, but it would slowly taxi and I had to chase it down the runway and run up the ramp in the back and get in. Well, it landed, turned around and moved slowly down the runway. I started to run after the plane, heard an explosion and then another one. I took off like a bat out of hell, down the runway, up the ramp, through the aircraft and didn't stop until I was in the cockpit. That was my welcome in Vietnam. When I flew, got into Vietnam in uh, April of 1969, uh, we flew into Da Nang. I was a little scared. I'll, I'll be honest, I, I was Navy hospital corpsman. I wasn't ready to fight. Uh, but they took me from there on board a chopper to Quang Tri, where they uh, accepted me at 3rd Med Bat. Uh, when I first got there, they gave me a choice of the first six months I could spend in the field with the Marines or the or in third med bat in the hospital there. And I said, oh, I'll go get my first six months done in the field and get that out of the way. And uh, then spend the last six months working on the Marines in the hospital. And that didn't work out for me. But uh, I'll tell you what, it's it's an experience I'll never forget. And I can't thank the Marines and Army guys that I dealt with in the Vietnam. They've, they've changed my whole life and made me who I am today. David from Grays Lake Central has our next question. For Russ and Lewis, what was your job assignment and what did your daily routine look like? And how much did vary during your service? My job assignment was my MOS that I got while well, training for my MOS in the States. And that was uh, airborne infantry. And I carry uh, an M16 with me and my, my uh, initial job when I got to Vietnam, they flew us out to, to the jungle in a helicopter. And my job was, a, it was an infantry man but of course, uh, when you come upon a, a firefight and uh, some of your buddies get wounded or killed, and uh, so then there's got to be another guy to step up to that job. So uh, one of the jobs that I stepped up to was uh, point man. And as you guys know, point man had a very short lifespan. And uh, that's where I, got, where I got wounded. When when I got wounded, I was uh, a point man. Another job that I, uh, that I moved up to because our RTO got killed, it was an RTO, radio telephone operator. And also that person has a short lifespan in the jungle especially the RTO, which is next to the, which carries a, long, a radio with a long antenna. And uh, the, our commanding officer or our lieutenant's next to us. So uh, the, every time we started a firefight, they always went after the, the automatic weapons, which the M60, they went after that guy first. He had the shortest lifespan and after after that, they would go after the medic because if, if the enemy wounded somebody, the person that went to, to look after him was the medic. So the medic's uh, lifespan was sh uh, short also. Then it was the RTO because the RTO, then you get rid of uh, communications. And then uh, our lieutenant, which then you get, you get rid of uh, the, the person in charge. 
So like I said, I started out as an infantryman and I'm from infantry, I went to RTO, from RTO, I went to, uh, to point, point men. Thank you. My name is Russ, Russ Caforio and uh, <clears throat> I was an infantry platoon sergeant uh, in Vietnam. Uh, and my job was to uh, do search and destroy missions on a daily basis. Uh, the B-52s would come in early in the morning and do bombing raids. And then we'd be, we'd be sent in to do search and destroy missions to find out uh, what the, how many uh, uh, were killed or wounded from the enemy. Uh, we carried M-16s. I carried a Starlight scope, grenades, and ammunition. Uh, and at night, we would have to go on ambushes every few nights. Uh, we'd go on an ambush and set up an ambush someplace. And... Uh, uh, when we weren't out on assignment and we were back in base camp, that's the only time we got any kind of a variation. Thank you, Russ and Lewis. Amelia from Downers Grove South is next. Uh, for Charles Nichols and Terry Blue, how would you describe the relationships and camaraderie you formed while serving and how did it impact your experience? Well, I don't know. Uh, the camaraderie was, was a, a big buildup. Vietnam was something that a lot of people didn't want and a lot of did. Those of us that uh, did participate in Vietnam was because we were going to a country that needed our help. Uh, a country that was uh, being taken over by communism where half of it was communist and the other half was not. Well, we were there to support uh, those that did not want communism. We were support. We were there to support those that wanted the 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 freedom to be able to do what they wanted to when they wanted to. And the the hype here in the United States was that uh, it's a it's a war that we should not become a part of. But for me, it was something that I felt like I had to do. Uh, and it was something that my country had asked for us. It had asked for volunteers to help this small country uh, become independent. And along with that, uh, like one of the other guys said before, I watched uh, programs that had John Wayne in them and, and other Marines. And I felt that the Marine Corps was the, the, the best unit that there was uh, in the military. So I wanted to be a part of what was the very best. And I wanted to be a part of giving these people the, the freedom to be able to do as they please to do. Thank you, Charles. James will ask you the, the same question. Uh, the fact that I spent the amount of time that I did in the Marine Corps from 67 in and out until 98, I developed different relationships during different periods for different reasons. In Vietnam, the relationship was camaraderie to save my life because I had to depend on those people that I met because all we had was each other to depend on basically. I was able to build a relationship with the people in every area I was in, really. I enjoyed it. I've, I've also been fortunate to be doing something now to help veterans since I am no longer in the, uh, doing active duty in the Marine Corps. I help veterans get claims taken care of, and I've had some very uplifting experiences just helping people that have had too many problems either dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder, which in itself creates a lot of problems and a lot of people relationships. I'm talking about alcoholism, drug abuse, broken marriages, suicide, just a litany of different problems. And this has been an uplifting experience for me. I really have developed a real close relationship with literally thousands of veterans all over the U.S. because I'm a national service officer. All right, Juliana from Wheaton North will ask the next question. 
Hi, this question goes to Pat Tyner and Bob Bruzek. Was there anything fun about being in the military? Hi, Juliana. Yes, there was a lot of things to, that were fun being in the military. On a personal note, there was the travel. Work-wise, as an air traffic controller, for a while I did work in a tower and we sometimes had the Thunderbirds come through and uh, the crews would kind of jockey for position to be able to, to be the one to clear the Thunderbirds for takeoff or for landing. That always was a big hit. And one particular time they were at an air show at Williams Air Force Base in Arizona. And during one of the maneuvers, they flew or one of the planes flew beneath the level of the tower windows and we were able to look down onto the pilot's helmet as it screamed past the tower and and I love airplanes and so that was always something really neat and always to be near the flight line to see all the various aircraft come in and out and those were the things that I, I most remember about uh, that uh, the fun being there in the military. Hello, Juliana. Thank you for your question. Uh, to a degree, there was a little bit of fun, but most of the time, really not a lot. We were training for the military. Almost all of us knew we were heading for Vietnam. So just about everything we did train for was needed to help make sure as possible that we came back home safely especially with the weapons training. After weapons training, I was stationed at Port Wainimi, California, while I waited for the battalion I was assigned to come back from a previous tour. Uh, not much fun at all. <laughs> Sorry. Well, thank you both. Now we'll welcome Helen from Wakanda High School for the next question. Hi, um, this question okay. is for Lou and Terry. Was there anything you did for good luck while you were serving in the military? Uh, I had a good luck charm that I, <laughs> that I had over in Vietnam, and I, I wore it around my neck. I, can, I, I brought it out to show it to you all. It was a tiki doll that I wore around my neck, and I don't know if you all can see the tiki doll that well, but it has an M16 round through the chest. Can you see it? This was my good luck charm when I was over in Vietnam. I wore around my neck. So when I was out on those ambushes on top of graves at night or sleeping in rice paddies at night, we were young people, our young lady and young men. And we were put in a situation where we had to defend ourselves or else we wouldn't be able to be around. And to be honest with you, I, I thought about going, doing this, for the uh, high school students, and I try not to be too graphic or anything. Our job as, as U.S. Marines was to simply go out there and take people's lives. So you can call us assassins, but I can honestly say I did not look at it that I was actually taking people's lives. I just looked at it that I was in a situation where either if I didn't take their life, they would take my life. And that's the way I felt. So I wore this little tiki around my neck, hoping, <coughs> excuse me, hoping that I never <coughs> caught around like my little tiki doll. And then I messed around, let a doggone mosquito <laughs> take me out. <laughs> and I, had, I caught malaria in Vietnam. To answer her question, my good luck charms were my rifle, my grenade, my bayonet when I wasn't in my tank. And I just like to, I, I treated them well and they treated me well. And as far as uh, anything other than that, I talked to God, not as often as I should have, but I did. And he kept me safe. And before, before uh, I close and before this whole thing gets over with, I'd like to thank the young people that are involved in this because it gives us uh, a little respect and how they, uh, they step forward and they're interested in, in, in the war 
They're in Vietnam anyway. And the people, the veterans that are uh, being interviewed today, especially the corpsmen. I got a soft spot in my heart for the corpsmen. Let's have Madeline pose our next question. Okay. For Tom and Charles, what does freedom mean to you? For me, freedom is the ult- the ultimate of, of what a man exists for. It's, it's something that's earned and not given. To me, it's, if I can go back a little bit, it, for me, it's going back to my parents and my, my parents after them was were slaves, some of them. And they were told what to do, when to do it, how to do it. And for me, in my era, to be able to do what I want to, when I want to, it gives me that, that ultimate feeling that I've surpassed what we went to Vietnam for, which was communist suppression. And I will go on each and every day feeling that, you know, I, I'm blessed to be able to say that, you know, freedom is, is probably the utmost thing that an, any American could ask for. And I would and I would do it again to make sure that this country stays free so that uh, we don't go through the era that Vietnam did. Okay. Freedom to me is the ability to accomplish my goals without any kind of restrictions for family, for workplace, to be the best in whatever one chooses to do and to share that ability with others by being a mentor to one and all. Yes, that affected me while I was in Vietnam. And since I've been home, I was a businessman. I think uh, helping my fellow soldiers in Vietnam while I was a gunner on a, uh, on a Huey, we took uh, supply missions out. We picked up wounded Marines. We did everything. So that, that helpfulness was always there. Be, I in, be me in country, or when I came home here, raising my family and uh, making a life well worth living back home. Fantastic. Amelia is back and she's got a two part question this time. All right, this is about the environment where you served and it's for Joe and Donna. What were the best and worst weather conditions you experienced and did you come across any interesting animals? Um, I was in the Philippines and some of the weather in the Philippines was the best weather you could ever experience. It was the typical temperature was high 80s, low 90s. It was sometimes muggy, but not too bad. You would, um, you could survive it. I think more because we were on the ocean. We had, you know, an ocean breeze was better, but the worst weather was the rainy season. We said that the rain actually went sideways. You you expected to be wet because there was no getting around it. Umbrellas were completely useless. Most of the people walked around with flip flops on all the time because they had they knew their feet would be soaked. But um, the one year that I was there, nineteen I believe it was nineteen seventy nine, had the worst rainfall in three months we had 86.9 inches of rain, which is almost three inches a day. There were ro- roads washed out. The, um, the road between the base where we lived, because we lived at one base and worked at another, the road was washed out and we got bus to one side of the, the washout, had to walk around and get on another bus to go the rest of the way to the other base. Um, people had gotten washed out in a bus that had gone off the road into the ocean. And um, it was pretty drastic weather. The animals in the Philippines that were impressive were the monkeys. The monkeys would get into things. So you had to be really careful about what you left laying around. Well, I remember one day coming out of the PX and there was a monkey on a motorcycle that had gotten hold of a box of Kleenex and was sitting there and tossing the Kleenexes in the air like it was confetti and, you know, hoping to get to the bottom of the box for the prize or something. It was just, it was hilarious. But the monkeys, you had to be careful because they could also attack people. 
Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, I was uh, at the base of the Tainan Mountains mm -hmm. and uh, I remember one day it was blue skies and a mist was coming down. And I asked my interpreter, I said, I've never seen that before. And what he said was, well, that's the humidity. I've never seen the humidity as a mist that was coming down. Um, one of the radio man had a thermometer and uh, it, had, um, it, it, it had broken, but it was stuck on 120 degrees between three and four o'clock in the afternoon. We'd get a downpour again, being next to the mountains, the downpour is extra heavy because uh, it comes over the mountains. And uh, you had to actually put your head down because you couldn't breathe if you were standing uh, in the upright position. Uh, you'd be gasping. And it would last for about 15 minutes. It'd be heavy. There was water everywhere. And within about, I don't know, 20 minutes or so, it was soaked into the ground. And within a half hour, 35 minutes, you didn't even know it had rained. I did see elephants. Uh, I did see uh, many different snakes. Um, when I asked them which ones are, are poisonous, and they said, consider all of them poisonous. Uh, they did have one type of snake that was called a, a three-step Charlie. And three-step Charlie, if someone was bitten by that particular type of snake, uh, they said you had three steps to live. And so whenever we saw snakes, we either shot them <laughs> or we didn't go anywhere near them. And there were many different types. Um, pythons, uh, which you, you definitely could stay away from. Uh, but, uh, just every snake that I saw, and I was a combat medic, so I was always worried somebody gets bitten by a three-step Charlie and I couldn't fix the, anything. I, you know, he had three steps. Uh, but, uh, a, one of my friends that was also a medic while he was out in the jungle, he said he saw tigers. i never saw a tiger but I did see elephants. I did see every kind of snake you can think of or I, that you saw in books. Thank you, Amelia, and I appreciate your question. All right, we'll go to Annabella for the next question. This one is for Pat and Bob. How did you stay in touch with your family back home? Hi, Annabella, thanks for the question and thank you to all the students tonight who have uh, given their time on this beautiful day to uh, spend some time with us. Well, back in the late 60s, early 70s, we didn't have cell phones. And so a lot of the communication with family back home was by letter and collect phone calls because we had to usually make the phone call from a payphone. And then when my husband went to the Philippines without me, he was there for a year before I was able to get over to join him. I used a portable cassette player to record video, uh, to record audio recordings, just talking to him about what was going on at home. We had a, a young son at the time and I would try to get him to coup or something, you know, maybe pinch him to make him cry so his daddy could hear him cry. But uh, those were the primary ways to, to communicate back in the old days. Hello, Annabelle. Uh, this is Bob. Thank you for your question. Uh, this is a two-part answer to your question. The first part is, while I was in the United States for training, I could get mail every two or three days. Uh, once I got to Vietnam, the mail became very sporadic. Sometimes a week would go by that I wouldn't get any mail, and then I'd get four or five pieces all at the same time. 
Okay. Uh, it was difficult to keep communications going smoothly, for sure. My mother and my friends were pretty good at mailing what was going on in the United States. My brother, Bill, was in the Army, and he was in Nam the same time that I was. We overlapped our tours by three months. He was 25 miles from Saigon. I was 30 miles from Da Nang in the north. Our mail could go back and forth in country for free. No stamps needed, which was really great. Uh, Mom would write a two-page letter and make a copy of both pages. Bill and I would each get half letter original and half copy at the same time. I put a notebook together since then uh, with all the letters written for a year. And uh, we never ever told her exactly what went on over there. Uh, after the service, once in a while, she heard Bill and I talking about something that she would say, you never told me about that. <laughs> I could never imagine how she felt having two sons, one in the army, one in the Navy, in Vietnam at the same time. Juliana, you're up next. For Russ and Joe, what was the local civilian's response to the Vietnam War? Well, they were friendly, but untrustworthy. Uh, many of them worked for the uh, US government over there on the uh, base, in the base camps. Uh, <clears throat> we had a barber in our base camp who turned, out, turned up uh, getting killed on one of the ambushes at night because he happened to be a Viet Cong. He was not a uh, South Vietnamese. Uh, so we had to be very careful. Uh, we called them farmers by day and fighters by night because we never knew who the enemy was. So even though we were, we were friendly, they were friendly, we had to be very cautious, be very careful because they were there for intelligence as well as being friendly. Hello, Juliana. Thank you for your question. And uh, as far as the locals, uh, I, again, I was a combat medic and uh, we used to have to uh, go through villages. Some of them uh, were considered uh, Viet Cong villages. And uh, so when you went in there, you were going there during the day. Uh, as a medic, I would check with the... Uh, the head of uh, the, the people that ran the village uh, about if anybody was sick, especially children. Most of the young women in the village were pregnant or had small babies. I'm talking about babies that were between uh, newborn and possibly about a year old. And our uh, captain was with us. And he asked the head of the village, uh, which again was a middle-aged woman. And he said, well, where are the men? And we knew where the men were. They were up in the Tainan Mountains and they were waiting for nighttime. And she turned as white as a sheet. She was afraid to answer. And then... Uh, she said, oh, there are no men. There are no men, just the old men. And he said, well, why are so many of the young women either pregnant or with small children? And she couldn't answer. She was stunned when the interpreter spoke with her. And then it was uh, Captain, La Captain Landry started laughing. And so did she. And so did the others that had heard the interpreter ask that question. We knew where they were. And, uh, but we weren't about to do anything with women, small children, and older men that were probably, I'm 75, uh, my age. And we left as friends. Those people were poor people that were starving to death. They had barely enough food to eat from their rice paddies because it was either um, stolen by the Viet Cong so they could feed their troops, or in the case of air airstrikes, the rice was ruined. So uh, I would say our, our unit, the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment, um, 
was as humane as we could be. But as my friend that was just on here said, you did not know who you could trust and who you couldn't trust. So that's never a good feeling. Thank you both. Mm -hmm. Madeline? This question is for Charles and Lou. Do you recall the day that your service ended? And how did people react when you got home? People, when I first came home from my first tour duty, I remember landing at Midway Airport. And uh, the people were terrible. They were terrible. I was walking through the airport in uniform. Uh, I was being accosted by uh, the civilians. I was called baby killers and whatnot. So while I was on leave, uh, I was criticized quite a bit. In fact, I stayed in the, a lot of fights. And for the first time in my life, I was in jail because I was fighting. Because people here in the United States were calling us baby killers, among other names. And it was something that I was not going to tolerate because I figured if, if I could put my life on the line to keep this these wars from coming here to the United States, then I shouldn't have to receive the type of treatment that we did. So the treatment that, that we received when we came home was terrible. It was terrible. And until 19, actually 1986, when Chicago had a welcome home parade, it was then the most heartwarming uh, event that I had ever participated in. But other than that, it, it was a terrible feeling. And that's why to this date, uh, people are, are thinking about how we were treated and how well, how different they treat us now. Try to understand, I'll try to explain to the young people. When you're in a combat situation like Vietnam, most tours were 13 months. And you live from day to day. You never knew, you never thought you were ever going to come home. And the day they told you you were coming home, actually they told you about five days ahead of time, you didn't want to do anything. All you wanted to do is crawl in a hole. Because while you were there, in your mind, you never thought you were coming home. So we boarded planes, and we, uh, we went to Okinawa for two days. And then from Okinawa, we boarded flights to the States. And we had our utilities on, or fatigues. We, they were uh, work uniforms. We didn't have our dress uniforms. Anyhow, when we, uh, when we got on the planes, there were commercial planes. The, the stewardess says, she says, well, our flight's going to take so, so long. She says, so rest, do whatever you want to do. So I closed my eyes because I figured that was the easiest and the fastest way to get home. And when that plane, it was at night, the stewardess uh, come on the air and she says, if, if everybody looks out the portholes of the plane, she says, you will see the coast of California. And that was home. I can't tell you what I felt when I seen the coast of California. And we landed. We got our uniforms on. They told us uh, before they released us, they says, when you go to the airports, when you go to the train depot, people are going to react to you in a negative way. And like the gentleman in the Marine said, we were spit on, we were called baby killers, etc. And coming back, when I came back in 1966, we didn't really even know that there was protest going on. And it was very disheartening. And that's why what you're doing today to honor the veterans. So we thank you for it. I thank you for it. Thank you. David has the next question. This is for Lewis and Russ, Lewis um, Rodriguez. Do you like it when people thank you for your service in public? Uh, yes, I do. 
because like like the previous gentleman has said, uh, I felt privileged to be acknowledged by young people like yourself that you're respectful to us and uh, you look up to us for what we did. So I, I admire that and I do uh, appre appreciate it and I like it when they thank me for my service. Yes. Thank you. I do the same. Uh, I appreciate it when people acknowledge uh, and I always take time to thank them for acknowledging it. I have had a couple times where actually when I was ordering food, one at a sit down restaurant and one at a uh, fast food restaurant that one at a fast food restaurant just recently where somebody just threw their credit card down and said, get whatever you want. Uh, and his father happened to be a Vietnam veteran as well. So yes, it's, it is nice to uh, be recognized because uh, we know that, uh, that it hasn't always been that way. Thank you. We'll go to Helen for our next question. Tom and Rick, how well do you feel the general population understands what you did in Vietnam and as a member of the military in general? Let me preface that when I was in Vietnam in 64 and 65 and came home, I didn't re run into any protest or any ill treatment at the airports. Uh, but then again, the war didn't have the type of publicity or reaction it was getting later, especially after the uh, Kelly massacre. The war became very unpopular with the public until the end. But today, I think people realize that us veterans who were in Vietnam, the majority of us were just doing our duty. And attitudes today have changed largely in part to the honor flight organizations across the country. And folks like you, students, in getting the information out what we did while we were there in country. I do speak at various gatherings and schools, and I do get thanked often for my service. Thank you. When I think about what happened uh, to me in Vietnam and everything, not too many people know exactly what went on in that country unless they were in the military and over there at any time. I was there, like I said, in 69. Nobody knows what happened to me over there. And to this day, I don't talk too much about it. I wouldn't change anything. Uh, I stayed, I, when we were on an operation, Idaho Canyon, I was wounded. I was the only Marine left with the platoon. And I wasn't going to be medevaced because I had wounded Marines out there. They're my brothers out there that needed to be taken care of. They weren't, they didn't need to be medevac because they, they, they weren't that bad, but they still needed somebody to take care of them. And I wasn't leaving them out there by themselves to get hurt even more. So I stayed out there for two extra days before I was medevac out when they sent the relief corpsman out to take my place. But I'll tell you right now, everybody that was in the military, uh, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, it doesn't matter. We are all family. We are all brothers and sisters. We all served our country during different times, during different wars, different battles and everything. And to be honest, I wouldn't change anything except maybe try to keep a couple more names off that wall. I'm sorry about those that I lost, but I wouldn't change anything and I'd do it all again, but they tell me I'm too old. So no, they don't know what happened to us in Vietnam or any war in that case. All they know is that we were in battles, that's all. They don't know what happened. So thank you for listening and asking questions and I appreciate it. God bless you all. What I would like to do right now though is uh, I wanna thank uh, Honor Flight Chicago uh, for the flight that I was on, number 91, first one with Vietnam vets. Uh, it was uh, a day of my life that uh, uh, just is so unbelievable. It's, uh, it's impossible to say, and I want to thank everybody uh, at uh, the Honor Flight for that uh, uh, ability to be able to do that. Thank you very much. And reference to Honor Flight Chicago, that in itself is more therapeutic, Doug, than you all will ever truly understand. And I think I can speak for a lot of the other veterans that have been on the honor flight. That was so therapeutic. It's unbelievable. I mean, we're all singing the same song 
is that it's an experience that we'll never forget as long as we live, the way that you all treated us, perfect strangers. I agree with him 110%. Now, I went on, I don't, I went in September uh, a couple of years ago, and it's an, it was such an honor, such a, I couldn't believe the way I was treated by everybody, especially the person that was right at my side throughout the whole thing, all the way. I, I've had back, three back surgeries, so I, when I first started, I was walking all the way through, and once we got to the Vietnam Memorial, I couldn't walk anymore, and he got a wheelchair out, and he pushed me around in a wheelchair, even though I was crying like a baby, but you guys made us feel like we were honored for what we did for our country, our country. That doesn't mean black, white, yellow, red, green, anything. It's our country. We are all Americans. Amen. And, and Amen. I, Amen, brother. I, thank Amen. you, brother. But I was raised, I'll be honest with you, I was raised with racism. We called you guys Negroes. You called us honkies. And that's the way it was when we grew up. But look at how we are now. You are my brother. That's right. And I don't care what color my patients were. I treated Vietnamese people that stepped on landmines on Highway 1. I treated them. I treated our people. I don't care. Color doesn't mean a thing to me. It doesn't. That's why I want to be a hospital corpsman till the day I die. Right on. Uh -huh. and right on. I just wish the rest of the world could understand the way I feel and we could go through this together. And well, one more thing, though. I have to admit, one thing made me feel almost as great, almost as great as the honor flight. And that was when I was uh, a veteran that was treated at White Sox Park. I was uh, called out on the field and uh, they told everybody that I was a veteran and I was, I was treated there and I had 34,000 fans cheering for me on the field. And it made me feel just as good, almost as good as that honor flight did, believe me. But it took me over an hour to walk from, the, from where I was on the field back to my seat because everybody stopped to thank me for what I did. It was, it's an unbelievable feeling the way they treat us now compared to when we came home. And again, thank Can I say something real quick, Rich? Absolutely. Okay, Here, here's the thing I was just thinking, we're human beings, we're not machines, we're not, we're not wild animals, okay? And I think when anybody treat another human being like that person is a human being and don't treat them like they're second class citizens and stuff like that, we can't help but feel good about that because who don't want to be treated with dignity, honor, and respect? That's the way everybody deserves it. And then the under Flag Chicago, they went beyond <laughs> just treated us with dignity, honor, and respect. Absolutely. I mean, they made us feel like we were the world. I, I, I tell this story all the time, and I, I got a big mouth, and I'm like, I'm going to hold y'all up. But I tell, I've told Greg, I've told uh, uh, Doug, I've told Nancy, I've told Kevin. I say it was almost like that day that I went on the flight, which was 10 July 2019. The guy, gather some of his top angels in heaven and say, I want you to go down to Chicago Midway and be there before 0400 hours because there's going to be a bunch of veterans, Vietnam veterans coming there. And I'm going to attach one of you all to each one of those veterans and treat that person better than they've ever been treated before in their life. And then he had another set of angels. He said, when they're going to leave Midway, Chicago, and they're going to fly to Washington, D.C. And I want one of you ought to attach yourself to one of those Vietnam veterans and treat. And that's exactly the way they made us feel, man. Yep. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yep. Anybody that went on out of flight Chicago and said they didn't enjoy it, they are without life. <laughs> I tell everybody that's it was phenomenal. phenomenal. They, they, everybody they, that's a veteran. They, they are without life. <laughs> <laughs> they, they cannot be having any life in them. Uh, 
this is a favorite subject of mine because yeah. I was one of the guys, I was on the first Vietnam honor flight, and I was one of the guys that did not want to go on the honor flight. I felt it was hypocritical because of the way they treated us when we came home. And I had one gentleman uh, from the honor flight, Chicago honor flight, Len Sawinski, who talked me into it. And I went. And it was one of the greatest days of my life. And I remember my guardian who helped me around. And one of, the, one of the things she told me, she looked in my eye when I told her that uh, my feelings, and she says, you need to remember that was then, and this is now. And it always stuck with me. And I think we all need to remember that. And the honor flight was the greatest day of my life, and I appreciate all the volunteers and everything you did. Thank you. Amen. I right don't dog. Agreed. Thank you to all of you for, for that. It's, we do what we do because we are grateful for you and, and we're so thankful that, that it shows and that you feel the love that we're trying to give. So thank you for that. We have, uh, we have two more questions uh, and we'll go to Annabella for the first. Um, so this question is for Lou and Donna. How do you believe your service has impacted the world today and did the war change your outlook on life? First of all, when we, were, when we were told to go to Vietnam or ordered to go to Vietnam, I didn't even know where Vietnam was, but it didn't matter because my country asked and directed me to go. And we went there to help people. And we went there to help people stay away from or fight a communist uh, suppression, dictatorship, etc. And if we helped them, of which we did, because you could look at Vietnam today compared to when we went there, and it's a striving country. And my outlook, when I, uh, it made me appreciate what we have in the United States. There is no other country in the world that gives us the freedom that we fought for and allows us the privileges and the luxuries that we have. And my outlook is grateful to all the veterans that supported all the wars that we were in in order to give us this freedom. So I thank you. Now, from my opinion, I, um, I truly believe that as a country, we intend to aid the downtrodden from being attacked and to protect their freedom when and where possible in, in any way. And I realized by seeing the Vietnamese boat people, I realized how lucky we had it in the United States, how blessed we are to have the freedoms we have. And um, I guess the biggest thing was that our freedom is important. It needs to be protected and preserved. It takes lives, but it saves lives. And that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, we'll have our final question from Amelia. Uh, this is for Donna and Joe. What advice would you give to a young person concerning the military? I want to first say thank you to all the students and to Honor Flight for this whole opportunity. It's been amazing to hear the other veterans. Um, and I believe that I, I feel that the regret, I have no regrets for my service. No, the only regret was that I got out too soon. And I feel that um, given the, I was given the opportunity to learn so much, both through the professional schooling that, uh, that I went through and through the people and countries that, and cultures that I visited and saw. It was just amazing. I learned that we have to respect all others, even dealing with a personality you might have um, problems with if you don't agree with them. You are learning how to accept that personality. You're learning how not to be. So there's a learning tool even in the negative. Keep your eyes and your heart open to learning every, from everyone and everything. Be mindful of the commitment you make. Be sure you're open and prepared for orders to be coming and given to you on a general basis. Remember, you're joining a team. You're not an individual. 
you don't have all you don't always have the big picture but as in a crossword i mean a uh, um, jigsaw puzzle if one piece is missing it's obvious but when they're all together it it's a beautiful picture the ranger training that i got before uh, we went overseas to Vietnam. Uh, again, I just heard discipline. That is total discipline and learning to push yourself further than you ever thought you could. Uh, that, uh, that served me quite well uh, when I got out. I was a different person. I had a different outlook on what life was about and the struggles that you have to endure if you want to be successful in life. And uh, I, I thank all that ranger training that I got at Camp Pickett, Virginia. It, it, was, it served me very well in my life. Well, thank you all so much for being here, for participating in this Q&A for our, our high school students, um, and especially our Vietnam veterans. And many of you have been on your honor flight. Some of you are still uh, waiting to take your honor flight. And we can't wait to get back to flying so that we can show you the, the same love and respect and dignity that, that James was talking about there um, that, that you all have earned through your service for our country. Um, Madeline, I'm going to put you on the spot real quick. Uh, we were speaking last week and, and someone referenced the future generations and how thankful they were that, that the future generations and, and our high school students were taking an active interest in this. And you had a wonderful response to that. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to, to that. I think it's really important that high schoolers are involved in any community service activity. But um, for me personally, I just, I've been so inspired and I've learned so much, even in only being like six months in this program, I'm just every day inspired by everything that the veterans do for our country. And I think that it's our job as the next generation to uphold ourselves to those same standards and really look up to those people who fought for our country and fought for the freedom for me to be able to have a say in the country because I'm free is amazing. So that's my answer. Thank you so much. Very good, mm -hmm. thank you. Yes, yes. tremendous. Mm -hmm. So once again, thank you to all of you. Uh, thank you, and, and we honor you all, especially here on, on Vietnam Veterans Day. And we're really appreciative that you took the time to, to share your stories and your perspectives uh, with our, our high school panel here. So thanks again to everybody. You're welcome. Thank, thank you, everybody. Yes. Bye -bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye.